Who do you think you are? It sounds like a very easy question to answer, doesn't it? It takes so many components to shape who we are and shape who others think we are. And we don't realize how many of those components there are until they're all thrown up into the air for examination. It takes dozens, sometimes hundreds, of pieces before we know what that final puzzle picture looks like. But how many pieces does it take to form one's identity? And out of those pieces, which ones prove to be the most important to you to lead a life filled with happiness? If I had been at a party a few years ago and been asked, so who are you and what do you do? I could have answered with any of these little bits of information. Well, I'm half Irish, half Hungarian. I'm a nomadic soul. I'm a world traveler. I've been in the fashion industry for over 20 years, pushing for diversity and change. I've been a curvy model all that time as well. I like to do a lot of things, and I'm an athletic woman, and I'm aiming to do my first 5K race really soon. And I'm really excited about it. But as I was turning 40, the only woman I know, excitedly counting down the days like a little kid telling everybody I was 39 and three quarters, I didn't realize that my body was shutting down on me. I didn't recognize the states of dis-ease with conditions like Hashimoto's and gluten ataxia, conditions I had never heard of before, that were bubbling under the surface. One day, five minutes into my routine jog on a treadmill, I flew right off the end, smack into the wall. And I didn't realize in that exact moment that my life flew off that treadmill as well. I went from rocking it out at boot camp to walking up a mere three stairs and falling asleep against the wall. And I went from rocking it in killer high heels in Fashion Week and on high-end runways to many days not being able to walk at all. Hashimoto's involved my body attacking my thyroid in a mistaken attempt to protect me. It brought about levels of disease I didn't know was possible, exhaustion, chronic pain, and other conditions. But if I thought that was bad, I didn't realize something far more damaging was bubbling under the surface. Gluten ataxia is a very rare condition, and by rare, I mean I'm pretty much the only person, <laughs> one of the only people, hashtagging about my experience on Twitter and Instagram. It changed my whole life. Basically, gluten, a protein or a binding glue, if you will, found in many foods, was causing an attack on the cells of my cerebellum, the part of your brain responsible for motor skills. It affected my walking, my talking, eating, and simple everyday tasks that we take so for granted every day. My entire life changed. I started asking myself, do I break down today and break down my pride and use a wheelchair? How do I apply for a parking sticker for my car? Will I ever be able to do a lecture again? Is my brain permanently damaged? Last year, as I sat in a mobility assistance cart at an airport feeling utterly defeated and deflated, I realized my angst didn't lie in my changing physical abilities. As I sat there desperately trying not to cry, I realized I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life, how I was going to make a living. I wanted a career helping people be healthy and happy, but who was going to listen to the girl stumbling off the cart, slurring her words about how to be healthy? As I sat there on that cart, I realized my biggest obstacle was not losing my physical abilities. My biggest obstacle was losing my identity. 
As I sat for the last few years in the universal timeout chair, as I now lovingly call it, that timeout chair became my life's greatest teacher. How honored I have been to been able to walk for minutes, days, weeks, months, or years in the shoes of others and get to appreciate their journey a hundred times over. You sit and you appreciate what it takes to have happiness in your life on a daily basis. As your identity ebbs and flows daily, you appreciate what really matters in your life. I negotiated with the universe and I said, okay, if I can never run a five kilometer race, if I can never walk one either, if I can't even walk one kilometer, please just let me play tag with my nieces in the backyard. Let me piggyback them. Let me walk along a California beach, dipping my toes in the ocean. Or let me go for a brief walk in the woods, inhaling the smell of fresh cedar. And I quickly realized that little moments are magic moments, and little moments are monumental moments. I didn't realize how much expression is in our arms, in our hands, in our legs, until using my limbs in different ways proved almost impossible or next to impossible. The simple act of trying to clap and show my appreciation at a performance not only exhausted me, but most of the time completely shut down my whole system, worsening my walking and talking abilities. I was so determined to go to a particular concert, and instead of standing there with my arms raised in the air, dancing it out in celebration, I just sat quietly in the chair with my eyes closed. To the person around me, I probably looked completely disinterested. Well, what an ungrateful concert goer. Like, who sits at a Nine Inch Nails concert anyway? I did. I didn't realize how much communication and how much expression are in our hands, our arms, our limbs. Dancing at a wedding, clapping at a performance, raising your hands in appreciation at a concert, or scooping someone up in a huge bear hug at the airport because you're so excited to see them, or saying yes when you're so excited, even if no one else is in the room to see that action. And just as these tell a story, I realized that our actions announce who we are before people see us. I always remember my, the sound of my father coming home from work, the way he'd stand and shuffle his feet at the front door and shift his weight from side to side was distinctly his. And the way he'd put the key in the lock and turn it, the sound was distinctly his. Somebody else could come home at his exact arrival time, yet I would know in their mannerisms, in their sounds, in their nuances, as to who was who. And I realized, with my ataxia, as my gait and my walking dramatically changed, that the subtle announcement of me was gone. And the days that I would stomp or walk in a different way, change the perceptions of people towards me as well. On the days that I would walk down the street, swaying because I had no balance, seemingly looking drunk, people would avoid eye contact with me and look away embarrassed. And then the other days, when my legs had a different mode of operandi, and they would just clomp down the street like a little kid excited to be splashing in puddles, people would smirk. And their expressions to me were open, friendlier. But was I not the exact same person, only with a different walk? How dramatically the perceptions of who I really am changed just based on how I was walking. Sometimes we don't have to walk a mile in someone's shoes. Sometimes maybe just taking a few steps will help you truly understand them. And just as this changed, so did scent in my life change. Scent is probably one of the most animalistic and basic of the senses. 
And one day, as I took beauty products and scents that I can no longer use because of their ingredients, and I handed them over to a friend, scents that I had picked to reflect me, something that I had chosen and gravitated to, I realized I handed over something so much more important. I handed over a piece of me and something I didn't even realize was there until it was gone. And just as scent changed, the visual perception of me by others changed based on my evolving size and shape. Under a doctor's guidance, I adopted a gluten-free and then a paleo way of eating, or as I like to call it, getting back to basics or getting old-timey. And the chronic pain I had been in for years vanished one day, and I sobbed from sheer and utter gratitude. And in a little over a year, I lost almost 50 pounds on strict doctor's orders not to exercise. And the exuberant weight comments were sent my way with such excitement over and over and over again. And oddly, these were the only changes in me that were ever noted by anybody. I wanted to say to them, there are so many other things in my life, there are so many other shifts that are so much more important to me than my changing shift. The food culture in my life had changed dramatically. It changed who I had known myself to be since birth. I was mourning not being able to go to the majority of my neighborhood restaurants, the cultural interactions with the people in those places, the hellos and goodbyes and traditions in different languages. I was mourning all the hours I spent in the kitchen with my grandmother, who taught me all her recipes from the Hungarian old country, my St. Patrick's Day celebrations, and all the items on a typical Irish pub menu. For me, a food cultural shift was a much bigger shift than my weight or my shape. I wasn't aiming for a skinny body. I was aiming for a healthy, strong body. And as I kept hearing these comments over and over, I was flooded with all these accomplishments I wanted to tell them about. I was able to eat today with a fork and not stab myself in the face because my arm remembered how to do it. I could walk today for 15 minutes and not become completely exhausted. My hand remembered how to write again, and my hand remembered how to type again. Since walking away from trying to model as a skinny teenager to being discovered years later in a mall as a healthy, curvier 14, my body was always a gift to me, and I started my career being true to that body. My body allowed me to see the world and have adventures and meet people, work with crews in cities and countries I would never have seen otherwise. Most importantly, my body allowed me to represent women who never saw themselves in fashion. There was no sweeter success for me than walking out on a runway and being the only model oversized two and walking out to massive applause from women because they could see themselves in me, in my body on that runway, and they would feel connected. My body was not something I needed to hide. My body wasn't something I needed to put aside and pretend it didn't happen. My body was a gift and always has been. One day before my food shift, I was in so much pain, and I hugged my stomach like a young child one doesn't know how to soothe, and I fell to my knees sobbing, and I said out loud, Pick a size. Be whatever size you need to be. Be a 4, be a 14, be a 24. I don't care. Pick a size that allows you to go out and be free and live your life. And I knew in that very moment that my true soul's identity had no size, shape, or weight. I could go anywhere in this world in any size gladly as long as I could be happy, healthy, and express who I really am. 
And during this time, I was so aware of the messaging in social media, on the internet, in magazines, on TV, summer body, bikini body, better body, make your body better, before and after body. Before bodies were cast away as if they should never have existed, should never have happened. I realized, looking at all this information coming my way, that I loved my body 50 pounds heavier just as much as the 50-pound lighter one in present day. My 50 pounds heavier body wasn't a body to be ashamed of. It wasn't something to hide or banish. It was a good body, a brave body that had done its best to cushion me from pain and help me through this experience. It wasn't a body that should be shamed. It was a body that should be thanked. I realized quite quickly that an energetic body is an incredible body, a magical body. For when your brain ceases to send signals to its parts, it doesn't matter what that body looks like. If your brain doesn't allow you to create and think and be who you need to be in this world and have a life, you have nothing. And on days when I had energy, I didn't care what the packaging looked like on that second chance. Any packaging was good packaging, beautiful packaging, magical packaging. And I took that packaging out for a walk, or I danced. Our identity is like a patchwork quilt. We lovingly weave stories and new experiences into and onto our quilt. Like pieces of our identity, we put new patches on, new we sew in new fabric and new colors. As we grow, our quilt grows. I've learned so many new things in the last few years, and I've added new pieces to my quilt. I've discovered new foods, new restaurants, new ways of cooking, new experiences. I've met amazing new people at events, at farmer's markets. I've discovered new beauty products and new scents. I've discovered new modes of exercise. I take all of these new pieces of me and I place them lovingly on my quilt along with the others. When our lives begin to be measured in steps, how many steps from the couch to the kitchen? How many steps from the car to the store we quickly realize how magic everyday moments are. And we quickly realize what it takes to not only survive, but to thrive. A sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment, dignity, the ability to interact with others, and the ability to be able to tell the world who you really are. I am so grateful to have been able to go on this journey of identity for this amount of time, to find out who I really am. And I invite you, as you think of who you really are, to share in this philosophy. I am not a before and after. I am an always. Thank you.